This week, I've been thinking a lot about the topic of leadership. Projects, causes, even churches rise and fall on leadership. I love collecting quotations and, and writing down quotations that are memorable to me. And in studying for the sermon, I came across a quotation about leaders that I really like. So if you are a student of leadership, write this down. The true measure of a leader's value is how long he could remain dead in his office before anyone noticed. I thought that was pretty good. That's a good indication of, of uh, the importance of, uh, of leaders. I was reading a book called The Tale of a Tardy, uh, the Tardy Oxcart by Chuck Swindoll. It's a book filled with stories. And he tells a story about a historic church on the East Coast. It was a magnificent church building. It was a church that had a very rich history, but it was a church that had fallen on hard times. And the congregation had grown smaller and smaller and smaller. And they finally called a pastor. And when the pastor arrived, there were only a handful of people who all sat in the back row. So the pastor actually took his podium and he came down from the platform and he, he moved it all the way to the back row and he started to preach. And he was a good preacher, but, but not only was he a good preacher, he was a good pastor. And as a result of the fact that he did a good job pastoring the church, the church began to grow. And he had to move his podium back toward the front of the church until he was not only back up on the platform, but the congregation even had to sit up in the choir loft because all of the pews were full. And then that pastor received an invitation to become the president of a prestigious university on the East Coast, and he left the church. And another pastor came. And the new pastor was a phenomenal orator, a great, dynamic speaker. But he was not a great leader. He didn't cast a compelling vision. He picked the wrong fights, he alienated people, and gradually, one by one, family by family, the church emptied until, once again, it was just a handful of people sitting in the back row. Same building, same location, same community demographics, but different leadership. I'm using this sermon and the next one that I deliver to finish our study of First Peter. We were in that study a few weeks ago and we took a break for a different series. Now we're back finishing that series with two messages. And today we're going to talk about the importance of good leadership. First Peter was written to people who desperately needed good leadership. Their world was in crisis. First Peter is written to people who were basically refugees. Persecution came down on the church in Jerusalem and it drove people out of Jerusalem and they moved into an area that is now what would be modern day Turkey. In the, in the first Peter it's referred to as Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. I looked up that area on my church map and it's basically exactly where the nation of Turkey is. So they went to the area of Turkey, and wherever they ended up, churches formed. And the churches needed good leaders. Now the rest of the book of 1 Peter is written to everyone in general. But when Peter gets to chapter 5, he turns his focus specifically to church leadership specifically to elders. Peter opens chapter 5 like this. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and as a witness of Christ's suffering who will also share in the glory that will be revealed. 
I'm part of a group of pastors who meet once a month for breakfast. And when we meet for breakfast, we engage in what I would call shop talk. We talk about what pastors do. And I, to be honest with you, and I'm being very sincere, I often feel a little bit guilty because some of them are in really tough situations and are embroiled in conflict with their congregation and all sorts of things are going wrong. And I always come away feeling very blessed because we have a good thing going here. And, um, but we engage in shop. We, t we talk about what it's like to be a pastor, what the, hard what the hardships are, what the blessings are, what we're planning on doing. It's just shop talk. Um, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4 is basically a record of shop talk between Peter and the elders elders who are overseeing all of these churches that are spread all across the nation of Turkey. Now, Central Christian, by the way, is an elder-led church. There are different ways that you can govern a church. We are an elder-led church. So what that means is we have a team of six or seven elders who oversee what's happening at the church. They're selected by the congregation. The congregation votes. And I am a member of the, I'm an ex officio member of the Board of Elders, which means that I don't have a vote, which means that I am never to blame for anything that happens because I'm just a non-voting member. Um, but but that, that's, a, that's kind of a, a system of checks and balances um, and the elders help lead the church and I am one of the elders. I'm the teaching elder on a board of, of elders. The only difference between me and the other elders is that this is my vocation and the others volunteer their time, and my focus is more specifically on teaching. I'd like to ask our elders, a couple of elders who are out of town, they're traveling this weekend, they're not here. But I would like to ask our elders if you would just briefly stand up so that people can see who you are. Gail Myers way in the back, so look around. I would like to ask, if you've ever been on the board of elders, stand for just a moment so that people can see who else has been an elder here. If you've ever been an elder, go ahead and stand up. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Leadership is important. 1 Timothy 3, verse 1 says, here is a trustworthy saying. Here's a saying that you can depend upon. Here's a saying that's true. If someone aspires to be an elder... They are desiring an honorable position. So it would be a good thing, particularly I'm talking to some of the younger people here, it, would be, it is a good thing if you say, you know, someday I would like to be an elder in the church. I'd like to do that. I would like to provide that type of leadership. And if that's, your, your, if that's a thought that resonates with you, go to the passages in the Bible that talk about the qualities that elders ought to have and work on developing those qualities in your life. But it's a good thing to want to be an elder. Here's a big idea for today's message. A crown of glory awaits elders who faithfully feed, lead, and protect the people in this congregation. The Bible says there's actually a crown, a crown of glory that elders will receive if they faithfully feed, lead, and protect the congregation. There are actually two things that result in glory in this passage. Uh, there's, one, there's one section where it says that if you suffer with Christ, you will receive glory. There's another part of the passage that says if you are an elder and do a good job, you will receive glory. Now, if you have ever been at an elder's meeting, you know that sometimes both of those things happen at the same time particularly long elders' meetings. You, you suffer and you're an elder, you get glory for both. So the more miserable the meeting is, the more glory that you get, is I guess what, what uh, Peter is saying here. So who, who are elders? What, what is an elder? Let me define an elder for you. Elders are those who are appointed by the church to care for the congregation and to oversee the functioning of the church. That's what elders do. They care for the congregation. They oversee what's happening here. There are four different words that are used for elders in the New Testament. Testament. There's the word elder, there's the word overseer, there is the word shepherd, and there is the word bishop. And they all refer to exactly the same office. People who are selected to oversee the functioning of the church and care for people. I was a little bit disappointed that pastor did not show up on that list. 
pastor, it doesn't show up in the, in the New Testament. Some, some versions act, will use the word pastor, but pastor is not one of the words, and that, that kind of struck me as odd, so I wondered, why, where did this term pastor come from? Pastor is actually a derivative of the Latin word for shepherd. So the word, so if you refer, my title is senior pastor. I'm actually the only pastor. Uh, I guess senior, senior must refer to my age, not my position. Um, but when you refer to me as Pastor Carl, what you were really saying is Shepherd Carl. That's what pastor means, is someone who serves as a, uh, as a shepherd. The word bishop is the... the um, Jewish people were familiar with the term elder. Greek and Gentile people were familiar with the term bishop. They mean the, they mean the same thing. So Peter engages in shop talk with elders who are spread throughout Turkey, and he makes three points. Here's the first thing that Peter says. First thing that he says is that it's very important that elders serve with the right motives. Your motives matter. And he draws a number of contrasts. Um, first of all, you were to serve, serve not out of greed for money, but out of an eagerness to serve. Not out of compulsion, not because someone twists your arm and kind of forces you to serve as an elder, but because you are willing, and the text says, as God wants you to be. God wants people to be willing to serve as leaders in the church. He's pleased with that. He wants that. And, and then the third comparison, the third contrast, talks, I think, I think it speaks to leadership style. And it says, elders, in terms of your motives, are not to lord it over people, but rather they are to lead by being a good example. So the elders shouldn't go on a power kick and say, I'm an elder, I can make things happen the way I want them to happen in this church. Sometimes that happens, and that can get really messy and, and really ugly. Elders are not to lead by exerting power. Elders are to lead by being a good example. Our elders set the, the standard for what faithful church membership looks like. You lead, not by exerting power, but by your example. Next, he reminds elders that, that elders who serve well will, be, will actually receive a reward. In verse 1, it says, Elders share in Christ's glory. I appeal to you as a fellow elder and as a witness of Christ's suffering who will also share in the glory that is going to be revealed. In verse 4, Peter says that elders who serve well will receive a crown of glory that will, nev that will never fade away. Here's an amazing thought for people who, who have been elders, who are elders, or who aspire to elders. At the end of time, when we all stand before God and he reviews everything that has happened in history, God will give glory to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ will be glorified at the end of the age. And what this passage says is that Jesus will turn and share his glory with people who have served the church. And that's, that's amazing. There's going to be a point in time where Jesus will say, Carl, uh, you did a great job as, as elder. I, I saw the hours that you put in at Central Christian Church. I'm going to, I want you to have a little bit of my glory. You helped accomplish something that's important in my kingdom. That's amazing. That's an amazing thing to, to think about. We will share in God's glory. And then Peter gets to what I believe is the very heart of his message. Uh, remember um, that when we started this series on 1 Peter, I told you that, that one of the characteristics of 1 Peter is that it is filled with imperatives. Imperatives are orders, not suggestions, but places where um, Scripture says you must do this. And here's an imperative that shows up. It said, first of all, he said, make sure that you're serving with the right motives. If you do a good job, you will get an amazing reward. <clears throat> and now I have a command for you. Elders must be shepherds. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care.
There are two words for shepherd, and the, the one that, he, that is used in this occasion puts the specific focus on tending the flock, <clears throat> on leading the flock, <clears throat> on making sure that the flock is safe, and on binding up sheep who are in the flock when they get hurt. The image of being a shepherd is very powerful and personal to Peter. He didn't, he didn't pick this word <clears throat> randomly. <clears throat> but when he talks about being a shepherd, <clears throat> I'm paying the price for all of those hours in my barn <laughs> getting ready for last week's wedding and uh, my seasonal allergies. Peter didn't pick the word shepherd just randomly. But when he uses the word shepherd, I believe that Peter was thinking very specifically of three different times Jesus talked about what it meant to be a shepherd. <coughs> the first two accounts come from parables that Jesus told after heated confrontations with the Pharisees. So Jesus, Jesus wasn't always nice. Sometimes Jesus got really confrontational. Sometimes Jesus got angry. I call this smackdown Jesus, um, where he, he's, not, he's not praising people, but he's, he's letting them have it. And he does this particularly with the Pharisees. So uh, the first two accounts... Um, come from parables where Jesus is, is confronting the Pharisees. The first account, um, the Pharisees are mad at Jesus because Jesus healed a man on the Sabbath. So they had, they had a very rigid understanding. They're very legalistic. They're very judgmental. That's what Phariseeism is. It's, it's legalism. <clears throat> it's judgmentalism. It's, it's imposing standards on people that go beyond what is in Scripture. So they were upset that he healed this man on the Sabbath. So Jesus tells this story. And this is in John chapter 10, verses 1 through 8. So here's the main point of what it means to be a shepherd, and I've created the term elder shepherds. Elder, here's the first thing that's important for elders to know. Elder shepherds are to know and protect the congregation. That's what being an elder is about. It's knowing and protecting the people who are in the congregation, tending to the congregation. There's a knowledgeable relationship between the elders and the sheep. Jesus said, and this is a passage that Lewis read, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. When I speak to our elders, I'm, I'm including myself in that group because I'm a member of that team. Um, we need to know our sheep. So, so one mark of a good elder, whether that's a, a teaching elder like a pastor or a member of the board of elders, we need to go out of our way to know the congregation. And as our church grows, we have to work harder on that. Because as a teaching elder, it's hard for me to know everyone as well as I, as I would like to. So my elder, my people on the board of elders need to, to help me out with that. There's also a sacrificial relationship between the elder shepherd and the congregation. Because Jesus says in this parable that he lays down his life for the sheep. So as, we, as, as those of us who are elders seek to lead and serve the church... We need to be willing to sacrifice. Jesus gave the ultimate sacrifice, but there's a sacrificial aspect to being a good elder. And then we're going to transition to the next account. This is in Luke chapter 15, verses 3 to 7. And in this case, the Pharisees are mad because Jesus was hanging out with the wrong people. So in the first case, they're mad because he's healing someone on the Sabbath. Pharisees are always upset about something. So one way to identify someone who has the spirit of a Pharisee, they're always upset. There's always something bothering them that they don't like, and it's usually something that's not clearly spelled out in Scripture. 
It's something that goes beyond what's in Scripture, and they're, they're upset about it. So in this case, they are upset because Jesus has not been hanging out with the right people. It says, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law... So Jesus is hanging out with, with um, people who are not believers. He's hanging out with tax collectors, extortionists, prostitutes, um, all, all sorts of interesting people. And it says, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered. And muttered is a great word. Because this is exactly how it goes when, when people complain a lot. Is it's usually not direct. It's usually not, they don't usually go to an elder and say, I am upset, this is bothering. Actually, it's helpful. It's helpful to us when you do that. Um, to come in, but it's, it's like, it's, it's muttering. It's just kind of, it, it's usually not directed to people who can fix the problem. Um, and, and it says that they're, they're muttering, and here's what they say. This man welcomes sinners, and he eats with them. What a horrible thing to do. He's welcoming sinners, and he's eating with them. And as I was thinking about that, so, so here's the point. Here's the point that goes with that. Elder shepherds confront Phariseeism when it threatens the outreach of the church. So first of all, elders know and protect the congregation. Second, when a spirit of Phariseeism, or judgmentalism, or legalism starts to become a part of the church, a good elder shepherd will confront it and, 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 gently, and gently correct it. Um, you know, we, here, here's, I don't want to belabor this point. But I have picked up on a little bit of this, not from people here, but, but out in the community in terms of our outreach to the Muslim congregation that we've been seeking to build friendship with. I've, I've heard different people say, they've heard people say, why are they doing that? Don't they know those people are Muslims? Um, don't they know those people are going are to take advantage of them or going to hurt them? Um, so there have been people who have complained that we have gone out of our way, that we've gone to their picnic, we've invited them here. Um, whereas in, in my thinking, and I think in the, the thinking of our board, we're, we're just trying to follow the example of Jesus. Jesus went to where lost people were. He hung out with people that everyone else looked down upon. Yeah, and so part of being a good elder is helping us to confront that if it starts to pop up. Elder, the, the board of elders needs to help us resist the temptation to become an inward-focused church. An inward-focused church, all of the attention goes on making us comfortable. And, and little of the focus goes on what's happening outside in the, in the community and, and reaching people who are not already here. Elders help us do that. One, I, we're, work, we're going through um, the process of writing our budget right now. This does not sound very exciting, I know. Um, but one of the things that as a board we are really excited about is it looks like we're going to be able to at least triple the amount of money that we give outside of our church this next year. So we're identified. We'd like to find a couple of really needy churches in Springfield that are located in poor parts of town that are just barely surviving and out of the, the God's blessing for us, not spend money on things that just make us comfortable, but help them to survive. That's being an outward-focused church, and I appreciate the, uh, the help that our, our board gives with that. Um, I volunteer a couple of hours a month most of you probably don't know this. As a matter of fact, I don't know if any of you know this. But I, I serve on the steering team for Springfield's Global Education and Peace Network. It's a team that's sponsored by city government, and they are focused on helping people get along with one another. And it was a team that was formed right after 9-11, and part of the focus was making sure that there's a good relationship um, between all of the different religious groups, including Muslim groups that are, that are here in Springfield, that we know one another and that we're doing things that would prevent violence from ever breaking out in our community. So I serve on that team. And part of the, re the main reason I serve on that team, I am the only theological, theologically conservative Christian in, in the group. So I'm a bit of an oddity in the group. So there are, there are Hindus, there are Sikhs, there are Muslims, um, uh, there are um, uh, people at, at uh, 
um, mainline probably less conservative churches are there, but I'm the only one from a church that, that's sort of like, like this one, and I, lo I love being the only person on that team kind of coming from this perspective because it gives me a chance to try to present an image that is very different than what they have. They, they think that people like us are very hateful, judgmental, and I love countering that, trying to counter that image. So I hang out with people who have nothing to do with Christianity, um, and it's important that we do that. We have a group of people who love to hang out at Mother Stewart's Brewery. I think that's wonderful. There are lost people. There, there are people at Mother Stewart's Brewery. There are some people who rush there right after church on Sundays. Um, there are other people who go to Bob Evans. That's just as good. There are lost people at Bob Evans too. Um, but, but we need to be where there are people who are not here this morning. It's, it's very important that we be there, that we show up, and that we build friendships, and that we build relationships, and that we ignore criticism that people may level against us, um, because uh, the, the passage, the story that Jesus tells is a story of these lost sheep, and it says that Jesus says there will be more rejoicing in heaven when one lost person, like a tax collector, I hope there are no tax collectors here, but like, like a tax collector or a prophet, there's more joy in heaven when a prostitute hears the gospel and turns to Jesus than over a hundred self-righteous people. Jesus, Jesus, in this story, he is, he is in the face of the Pharisees. So when he says there's more rejoicing in heaven when one lost sheep is, is found than over a hundred people who were not lost, he is specifically targeting self-righteous, he even calls them self-righteous people in, in the parable. So... Um, I, I love the fact that there are people here who go out of their way to find people who are not connected to the church, not connected to Christ, and build friendships with them. And now we get to the last and by far most personal account of Jesus using a relationship between sheep and a shepherd um, to, to, to illustrate what elders are all about. This is John chapter 21, verses 15 to 17. How about our praise band to go ahead and come up and get ready to uh, close our service here. The account that we're looking at occurs just a few weeks after the resurrection. On the night of Christ's arrest, Peter had bragged about his devotion to Jesus Christ. He said, I love Jesus more than everyone else. And even though other people may deny you, I will never deny you. And you know how the rest of the story goes. Three times that very night, within hours of saying that, three times Peter denies even knowing Jesus Christ. And, and he was confronted by some really scary people. One was a servant girl. A little servant girl walks up and says, hey, I think, I think I recognize your accent. I think you were with Jesus. And Peter actually starts cursing and swearing and saying, I don't know the man. And, and the Bible says, a real gripping part of the story is it says that Jesus was being led from one room to another and he actually looked up and he made eye contact with Peter just as Peter is, is cursing and swearing and saying, I don't know who Jesus is. So you get to John chapter 21, and in the picture, I want to point out something about the picture. The name of this picture is St. Peter the Penitent, and you can't see it real well on the slide, but there's actually a tear going down Peter's face in the picture. And this is a picture that is meant to represent Peter as he's repenting of the fact that he had denied even knowing Jesus Christ. So the passage that we're in in John chapter 21 is a passage that's called the reinstatement of Peter. So, so Jesus is going out of his way to make, sure, to make sure things are right with Peter. And he's reinstating, saying, it's okay, I've forgiven you. You are a part of the team. Um, I, I, there's nothing wrong between us. So here's what happens in this passage. Three times Peter denied Jesus. Now when we get to John chapter 21, three times Jesus is going to ask Peter a very pointed question. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than, G than these? Looking to the other disciples. Peter replied, you know that I love you. Then feed my lambs. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said. You know that I love you. Then take care of my sheep. 
A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. Elder shepherds express their love for Jesus by making sure the church is spiritually well-fed. This message is an appeal to our elders, myself included, to guide our church through dark valleys, which all churches enter at times. It's a charge to take us with the greatest of all shepherds to green pastures that are full of lush grass and to lead us aside along still waters. Let me say a prayer as Micah and the praise man uh, take their places to lead us in uh, our closing song. Father, we thank you for calling us together as a church. Father, we thank you for people uh, down through the ages who have led as elders. Lord, for all of those who stood, who are not elders now, but, but at some point in the past, uh, sacrificed their time and their effort to help lead this church. Father, I pray for people who are on our board of elders right now, and I also pray for people who one day will be an elder, leaders of this church. Father, we submit our, we, we give ourselves to you and pray that you would guide us and work through us to reveal your vision for this church. Help us to serve well. Help us to serve with the right motives, not lording it over people, but being a good example. Father, help us to know the people who are part of this congregation. Lord, I, I pray that even, even today, if there are people who are here with a heavy heart or with a difficult burden, that you would help us to know of that burden, to know what they're dealing with so that we can walk alongside them. Father, I pray for people who are here today who are hurting. And Lord, I, I don't know every thought that's going on in, in, in people's hearts. I don't know the circumstances that people face. <clears throat> but I know that any time this many people gather together, there is someone who's carrying a difficult burden and may feel all alone. And I pray that this church would be a place <clears throat> where they are surrounded by shepherds who will bind up their wounds. Father, have your way with us as a church. We ask this in Jesus' name. I was thinking about the responsibility of a shepherd to know the sheep, to know when the sheep are hurting. Now, I want to talk to the sheep for just a minute. You have a responsibility to let us know when you're hurting. Every once in a while, we hear about someone who has gone through a difficult time, and I think, man, I wish, I wish we had known. So, so please, if there's something going on in your life and you, you need or would like for one of us to walk beside you, please let us know so that we can do that and, and, and help us to be a congregation where the shepherd, shepherds and the sheep uh, live together in peace and uh, uh, give everyone a taste of what it means to be part of God's kingdom. What better passage to close with than the 23rd Psalm? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely, goodness and love will follow me all of the days of my life. For I dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Father, we thank you for this day. Father, we thank you for the Good Shepherd. We thank you for Jesus Christ who leads us and binds our wounds. Father, we ask that your Spirit would work in us, make us the people you want us to be, and lead us to the work that you want us to do. We ask this in Christ's name.